before I share the word of God, I, I got this uh, 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 picture and I thought I want to show it to you just to tell you that, you know, uh, many of you are asking God for an answer. Well, God stretches out His hand and the answer is in the Bible. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share the word as it is today from the passage that has been, uh, we, we, are, we are doing the whole book of Acts. It's the second last sermon on the book of Acts. We will close the book of Acts 27, 28 in two weeks' time, and it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful sermon two weeks' time. But today, I just feel in my spirit that whatever it is, take it as from the Lord, all right? You've been asking God, speak to me. Many of you have been asking God, speak to me. So I don't know what it, your situation is, but I do believe that the answer is found nowhere else but the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So turn with me now to Acts 28. Sorry, Acts 24. Acts 24. Continuing from where Pastor Fergus left off last weekend. And you know Pastor Fergus is our young adults pastor. And I want to say that uh, it was probably one of the best sermons I've heard. Wow, it was so good. Don't you agree with me? Come on, you agree with me? Give a bet come on, give a better loud clap offering, amen? You know, it was so clear, very concise, and it was very difficult concepts, but he did it so well. And when I heard it, and I thank God that these are our young pastors, and it speaks very well for the future of this church. Amen? Amen. So, taking off from where he left off, uh, let me read Acts 24, beginning from verse 22 to 27. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, capital W, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias the commander comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. You will remember last week that Pastor Fergus shared this diagram as he did a message covering Acts 24, 25, 26. To summarize to you and to me, actually what happened to Paul when he arrived in Jerusalem en route to Rome. The final destination was Rome because as Pastor Fergus said, Rome at that point in time was the end of the world. All roads literally led to Rome. So in Acts 24, Paul defends himself before Felix in Jerusalem, in Caesarea. Then 25, Paul defends himself before Festus. And Acts 26, Paul defends himself before King Agrippa. And then in my final sermon, I will do Acts 27, 28. You don't want to miss that. It's very good. So let me focus now on Acts 24. Paul before Governor Felix, the governor of Judea. Who was Felix? If you read from the passage, several things we can glean about this man. First of all, he was well acquainted with the way. Verse 22. He was well acquainted with the way. The word well acquainted is the word acrobos, which means thorough, diligent, accurate. So when the translators translated the Greek into English, 
They said, well acquainted. Actually, Felix knew everything about a Christian faith. He was accurate. He was diligent. He was very thorough in his knowledge. And not only that, his wife, Drusilla, was a Jewess, meaning that from very young, Drusilla was tutored in the Torah. Very young, he knew about Moses, Joshua, all these things in the Old Testament. So he was, she was not unfamiliar with the Word of God. And on top of that, they had Paul. Paul was there, one-on-one. -on -one. Wow, how many of us had that opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one session with Paul? You can ask him any questions you want. Anything you don't know about Christianity, ask lah. And Paul will tell you, right? And wow, what an opportunity. And only that, two years. Two years. But you know what? He missed it. He missed it. He had everything going for him. Paul, two years, he knew exactly what, what was in the way. His wife was, was, a, was a Jewess. An amazing thing was this. He missed it. Why? He was so near and yet so far. Why? And the clue I had is in verse 25. The very few things that Felix said that was recorded in the Word, Felix said that. He said, that's enough for now. You may leave, Paul. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. In other words, Pastor, not now. It is not convenient. Not now, Paul, not now. It is inconvenient. But when I find it convenient, I will send for you. And he did. He sent for Paul frequently. Again and again. In other words, there was something in Paul, in what he heard that Felix knew was the truth. He knew that there was something here, but he just did not commit. Two years went by. He missed it. I want to share with you a message today entitled, The Power is Now. There is such a thing as the now moment. It is the power of now. In other words, it is not tomorrow. It is not waiting for a convenient time. Because when is convenient? What time is convenient? Convenient to who? To you. But time and tide waits for no man. I'm going to address two categories of people up front. The first category are the non-Christians and the pre-believers. You have been coming to the church many times, or even today could be your first time. But I'm very sure this is not the first time that somebody has shared with you about Jesus Christ. Christmas is around the corner. You don't even have to come to church to hear about Jesus. You can hear it in the malls. And your friend have shared to you about his or her faith. Some of you have been coming here for a few weeks or months. Why? Because you know that there is something here that is good. Something here that is truthful. You can put a finger to it, but you know that. You know that. You know that there is something here. So you keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. But you are not committed. I want to believe that today, 
The Bible says, as you hear the voice of God, today is the time of your salvation. So I'm going to give you all the call afterwards. You decide. But the second category of people I want to talk to are Christians. God is challenging you again and again and again to do something special. Probably many of you have vowed before the Lord ages ago when things were not going that well. So you tell the Lord, Lord, you will give me that deal. I promise you to do this. Lord, if you bless my children in the exams and you do well, I will give this. Lord, if you heal me, I will do this. But God has healed you. God has blessed the children. God has given you the deal. What has happened? It is not convenient, Pastor. It's not convenient. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe I wait until my children grow older. Maybe when I reach the age of 50. Maybe when I'm more financially stable. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is your convenient time. But the fact remains this. Now you say you're not ready. God is ready. Next time, when you are ready, God says, I'm not ready. The power of now. History records that Felix was executed when he was transferred to Rome under Emperor Nero. Don't know why. History records that Drusilla, his wife, perished when Mount Vesuvius erupted at Pompeii because she was there at the wrong time. They never made it. I want to challenge you today, my friends, even as I share the word of God. Remember the picture I showed you earlier? God, talk to me! And God then shows the Bible. The answer is here. You remember what Pastor Fergus said last week? You decide in your heart once and for all to honor God. You decide in the generality in your life that you want to put Him first. That you want truly in all the, the networkings, opportunities, everything that you have, that you want to live your life to advance the kingdom of God. The moment you decide that, then God will give you the specifics. Because you ask God, what do I do next year? Who do I marry? Do I do this? Do I do that? These are specifics. But you first decide in your heart, no matter what happens, I want to honor God. Then God will show you what to do. Very important. When God speaks, you have to respond because God is sovereign. God is God. He does not wait for you. You respond to Him in His timeline. Why? Uh? Why is it so important as I look at this scripture, what I call the power of now? Everybody say, the time is now. One more time, the time is now. I'm the right person. I'm in the right place. The time is now. One more time, I'm in the right place. I'm the right person. The time is now. 
In other words, God is speaking to you. Why now? Three reasons I glean from this passage. Number one, I notice that the longer you wait or procrastinate, the harder it is to say yes. And it is absolutely true. The longer you wait, the harder it is to say yes. The Bible says today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. In other words, you can harden your heart or no. It can become hard, stubborn, obstinate. Why? Because other things crowd in. The Bible tells us, Jesus tells us in the, the parable of the sower and the seed, every seed is good seed. And as the Word of God is sown, it falls on different types of ground. And one of the ground that it fell on grew. It grew. But thorns came. It choked the life of that, of that plant. And it is exactly what happens. Do you think that this year, next year is better than this year in terms of convenience? Next year has its own problems, right? Do you think that in five years' time, things will be easier? No. Do you think when your children grow older, it's easier? No. Every age, God is problems. So when is a good time? The answer is now. Because the longer you wait, the harder it is. Believe me, it is absolutely C.S. Lewis, an intellectual from Oxford, one of the greatest Christian apologists of all time, not only did God give him a wonderful intellectual mind, but also God gave him a very imaginative mind. So he writes books, he, he children's uh, uh, chronicles called Chronicles of Narnia, right? He, he, he wrote so many books and he's a poet, poet etc., etc. And one of his masterpieces was a book he wrote by the title Screwtape Letters. In his imagination, it was a book, it is a book, I don't know whether it's still in print, it is a book where he, the, the, the chief devil writes letters to the demons issuing orders and commands. So he collected all of this and put it down in a book. And in one passage, the chief devil began to summon all his demons and ask them only one question. Tell me, he said, what is the most effective way to prevent a pre-believer from becoming a Christian or a Christian from serving God? Basically, a pre-believer for becoming a Christian. And, 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 and one demon said, Oh, tell them there is no God. Oh, no, that not, doesn't work. Why? Because most people believe in some kind of a God. Another demon said, Hey, sir, sir, tell them there is no heaven. Tell them there is no hell. Because it is it's terrible. Hell? How can be? How can a God of love send people to hell? Tell them there is no heaven, there is no hell. And the chief demon said, No. Because most people believe in some kind of an afterlife. So one after another, a lot of, 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 of uh, suggestions were given, but the chief demon refused until one small demon said, Sir, sir, send me. Tell them that there is a God. Tell them there is a heaven. Tell them there is a hell. But they can wait. Maybe tomorrow. Touche. The devil said, that's the best. And do you know that up to today, this is the most effective way of preventing pre-believers becoming Christians, preventing Christians from serving God. Do you know that? 
Not today. Wait until a more convenient time. That's exactly what Felix has said. It's not convenient, Pastor. It is just not convenient. There's a law of procrastination which says this. He says the longer you resist, the ability to say yes loses more and more of their power till finally they cease to influence. In other words, the longer you wait, the Word of God then ceases to affect you. It is another sermon. You have learned a technique to distance yourself from the heart to the brain. It is purely up here. A good message. But you have learned over the years not to allow the Word of God to enter into the inner recesses of your soul. Very clever one, are we? Very smart one. The longer you wait, the voice of conscience gets hushed or, as I said, seared. You can't feel anymore. The longer you wait, your heart gets hardened. The longer you wait, matters of the kingdom of God becomes less and less important to you. Wow. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Listen to me very carefully, my friend. When God speaks to you, you've got to respond. Test it out. And then you respond. So why is it important for us to respond to God now? I, I don't know your situation. I don't know what God is saying to you, understand? It could be that something in your heart, in your life, that you know that you have to do. There must be something in your life that you know that you have to decide. I don't know what it is. But I want to believe. Remember the picture I showed you? God, speak to me. There you are. And that's my job. So just to deliver to you the word. The second reason why it is important to respond to God now is because of what I say, I, 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 I see the urgency and the importance of core essentials. If you look at the scripture, in the two years as recorded now, many words were spoken, but only very short things, important things are written. And you read in verse 25, as Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and a judgment to come, Felix was afraid. And he said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. What was it that Paul spoke that really touched the heart of Felix? That made him afraid. What I call core essentials. Three things. Righteousness, self-control, judgment to come. There must be many, many important things. Everybody say righteousness, self-control, judgment to come. Come, one more time. Say it loud. Say it loud. One more time. Are you ready? One, two, three. Wow. Why righteousness? Why? Because God is righteous. He's a just God. And it's not about whether you are righteous or I am righteous. Because all our righteousness are as what? Filthy rags, absolutely. It is the imputed righteousness that Jesus Christ has brought for us, bought for us by His blood at Calvary. It is not because you're so good. It is not because you're so great. It is because you're clever. No. Everything, all our righteousness are filthy rags. And it's because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And on the basis of that righteousness, you live your life. 
You decide that you want to live your life, a righteous life, honouring God. Not your righteousness, but the righteousness of God. In other words, you do what is right and righteous before God. If God says this is it, you do it. Paul expressed it very well in Romans chapter 7, verse 14. When he says the kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking, but what is the kingdom of God all about? It is about righteousness, joy, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. In other words, it is not about the physical. It's nothing wrong with eating, nothing wrong with drinking. We all love food, you know. We, we, we enjoy good things. Nothing wrong with that. But when it becomes God, that's wrong. When the pursuit of material things, when your focus in life is not on the kingdom of God, wow, that's wrong. So what is the kingdom of God about? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Why? Because when you have righteousness, you have peace. Correct or not? When you don't have righteousness, believe me, you don't have peace. You may look peaceful, you may look serene and tranquil and calm, but you know that inside your spirit man, there is strife, there is turmoil. But when you are righteous, and when you do what is right and righteous before God, and follow in His footsteps, when He says, jump, you say, how high? You will have peace. And with peace comes real joy. See, the kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking. The peripherals, the centrality of the message. Honor God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Come read this with me. Read Matthew 6.33 with me. Are you ready? Read out loud. Read out loud. You've heard me say this many times this year, and I want to repeat it again. Are you ready? Are you ready in the balcony? One, two, three. Come, one more time. Say it with me. Are you ready? One, two, three. And all these things, there's an order. There's an order. You seek first the kingdom of God. You seek Him first. You seek first. Very often, we reverse that order. God, you give me what I want, and then I will bless you. What? You bless me first, you give me what I want, and then I will serve you. What? But say no. I am God. You seek first the kingdom of God. You commit first. Why? Because if I bless you, very often, you don't thank me. Right? Very often, you forget. Right? No. Even in salvation, it's the same order. You commit first. And then, aha! How come nobody told me earlier and yet people have been sharing the gospel to you, right? And the moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, you begin to do manigmati, kebaktian Tuhan, kebaktian, bhakti, the blessings of the Lord. It's the same. You commit first. Then only God knows, ma, that you mean business with Him, ma. Correct or not? Righteousness. But why self-control, huh? That stumps me. I said, Lord, of all the essentials, maybe Felix was an un don't have self-control. I don't know. But clearly, it applies to you and to me. Why? Because all of us, believe it or not, are carnal. We still battle the flesh life. 
we still battle the so-called Bible saying the old man, even though the new man is inside of us, we still fight against all kinds of appetites, all kinds of, of things that try to snuff out and stifle the spirit man, correct or not? We battle. And so occasionally, or I hope not frequently, the old man surfaces out and we lose our temper. We do all kinds of things and the, the, the flesh life takes over. We pursue after, after things that don't matter. Why? Because we forget about a message. And so Paul says self-control. One of the fruits of the Spirit. You and I have to look at the life as it is and have an eternal mindset. I'm not asking you to be spooky. Eh? I'm not asking you to be super spiritual. Eh? No. You live your life every day honoring God. We need to control the flesh life so that the spirit man suffers out. The third essential is a clincher. Judgment to come. Wow. You know, eternal life begins now. The moment you and I accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, for us, eternity has started. Do you believe that? Do you believe, and I really believe in our faith, that even though we die and pass off from this world, we still continue to live our eternal life only with a change of address. So eternal life begins now. While you walk on the earth, while this frail human body is subject to all kinds of diseases, and that's why Paul says, I do not understand. I don't understand what I do for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, that I do. He's battling against the flesh life. He says, woe is me. What a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me from the body of death? In other words, we decay. But he says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus. You live your life your resurrected life now. You change your mindset. You change your mindset with an eternal perspective. You have enough and to spare. What on earth are you waiting for? You tell me. Everybody say righteousness, self-control, judgment to come. Do you know Felix was afraid? That's what he says. As Paul discourses on righteousness, self-control, and on judgment to come, Felix was afraid. But wait a minute, Pastor. Why should Felix be afraid? If you picture the scenario at a courtroom or in that room, Felix was sitting up there somewhere as the governor and Paul was down there on, on, the, on, on, on the floor and, uh, and uh, who had the power to release or imprison uh, Paul? Felix, right? Who has the power to execute Paul? Felix, right? And who was the one in chains? Paul, right? So who should be afraid? Paul! Paul was a prisoner. Felix supposed to be the free man. And that's Felix was afraid. Why? You see, the authority. The moment you and I get things right before God, you walk with your head held high, and you know and you know you live your life pleasing to God, and it doesn't matter what man can do to you, you see. And Paul rose up in his authority. Felix was afraid. The 
victim became the victor, the hunted became the hunter. Because you carry the presence of God in your marketplace. Very important. You get your core essentials right. You get it right. And God will then do the rest. So the power of now, why is it important? God speak to me. And God says, point to the Bible. Now. Because the longer you wait, the harder it is. It's more difficult. Why now? Because of the urgency and the importance of the core essentials. You have to discern and tell yourself, yes, pastor, these are more important and central compared to the other peripherals. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The third reason is very compelling. The reason why it is now is because the opportunity may not come again. For Felix, he was given two years. Two years is a long time. 365 days times two. You tell me how many days that is. And how many times, I don't know, but the word is frequently, he discoursed with Paul. He had an opportunity to hear the best of the best. And many times, the word of God has been preached from the pulpit. It is the word of God. But the key is this, he missed it. So I ask myself this question, church. Why two years? Eh? You know, in these two years, Paul was left in the prison, useless, and he was supposed to go to Rome. Don't you think that Paul really wanted to go to Rome? Don't you think Paul was very anxious to arrive in Rome because that's what he wanted to do? But Paul must have been asking God in the prison, God, when? Uh, why two years? In prison, some more, no? So was the two years for Paul's sake? Can't be. Whose sake do you think God waited two years? Felix. Felix. Why? As the governor of Judea, do you know when he becomes a Christian, what influence he will have? God waited. Gave him a chance. Two years. I don't know how long God is giving you. The whole concept of a time and a timeline, I mentioned it several times and let me repeat it again. It's very biblical. Again and again, Scripture warns us that is such a thing as a window period. And you have mentioned, heard me mention it again. Please excuse me if you heard it before. I give you three examples just offhand. First of all, Peter. Peter walking on water. We all know the story, right? Jesus was walking on water in a storm in the middle of the night, and they saw Peter, and they saw Jesus, and then Peter said, Lord, is that you? And, and Jesus says, yes, it's me. And then Peter said, Lord, bid me come to you. And Peter stepped out of the boat into the water, and he walked on the water, and we know that as he looked at the waves, he, he panicked and he drowned. And, and he drowned, he, he sank, right? And, and, and Jesus rescued him. But do you know something? The next time, if a similar situation occurred, and Jesus walked on the water, in the midst of a storm, I can bet you 
that 11 other people will be jostling and shoving to be the next one to come out of the boat. But it never came. It never came again. Only one chance. Peter took it. Season change, times change. The second illustration, I mentioned this before, children of Israel. Ten spies came back. Don't go. Caleb and Joshua say, it's okay. They heard and they were influenced by the majority, you see. And they didn't go. And God was so angry with them. And they grumbled and they mumbled and they murmured against the Lord overnight. Just one night, 24 hours. And you read in Numbers chapter 14, something happened to them that night. I don't know what. Because when God says, because you didn't go, you will not go for the next generation until this generation passes away. And you know something? They say, now I want to go. Now, God, please, now I want to go. And Moses said, don't go, don't go. Don't go. And you know something? You read this passage. They went. And they were killed. I don't understand. I really don't. Didn't they repent? Now they want to go. God opened the door. God says no. And they had to wait for 40 years. One generation. Before they entered the promised land. It is biblical. And the last illustration is very dear to me. You know, Mary, when he came to Jesus to break the alabaster jar of ointment, was it convenient? No. But it was one week before Jesus went to the cross. Did she know? No, she didn't know. But it was the right time, you see. The right time. Inconvenient. Why? Because it was held in the house of Simon the leper. Everybody was criticizing her, including the apostles, including Judas. You know, Judas said, hey, why you waste this good money? Eh? It should have been given to the poor. You know, carnality sometimes can sound very spiritual. It can, you know. It's a very spirit. Give to the poor. It was inconvenient. But Jesus says, don't stop her. What she has done at the right moment, at the right time, is to prepare for my burial. Listen to me very carefully. I want to believe that God is speaking to so many of us here today as I have the musicians up. The power of now. And I want to close by this picture that I began. And also by referring you you can to Luke 13. Turn with me to Luke 13. I cannot find any passage of scripture as explicit as this. When there is a time frame and a timeline for you to respond to God. In other words, there is no such thing as a convenient time because God's time is different from your time. In Luke 13, Jesus said this parable, but before he said that, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, Jesus said, No. 
unless you repent, you too will all perish. For these 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. Unless you repent, you too will all perish. Verse 6. Then he told them this parable. What's the connection? I'll share with you, inshallah. What parable? He said a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He went to look for fruit on it and did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now, I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree. Haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut it down. Commentators say the owner is God, the farmer is Jesus. Why? Why did Jesus speak that parable? And the only connection I find is repentance. Jesus was not distracted by what happened, the tragedy in the Tower of Siloam. But he went beyond that. He says, repentance, you have to repent. And then he said this parable. In other words, when you turn around 180 degrees from your old ways, what does God look for? Fruit. Because he then told the parable of the fig tree in the vineyard. Three years. No fruit. And Jesus said, give me one more year. I will water it. I will dig around it. I will fertilize it with the word. I will dig around it with water, the spirit. And if it still doesn't respond, cut it down. Wow, I think, God, what is this? That's how it is. See, that's how it is. Hallelujah. That's how it is, my friend. You respond to Him your way. I don't know. So in a short while, I'm going to give the altar call. Number one, for those of you who are not yet saved, today, I want you to come to my left or to your right when I give the altar call. You just come. I'm not even asking you to raise your hands. Come down from the balcony. You just come. It's your time to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You respond to the word. I also want to give the altar call for those of you which I know God is speaking to you. You have to do something. You commit first. Don't ask God to bless you with the deal. Don't ask God to take you out of that mess that you created. You commit first. That's the order. And I want to believe as you begin to do that, there will be a breakthrough. You seek first the kingdom of God, you see, and His righteousness. All these things your health, your family, whatever it is, the specifics will be given to you. Let's pray. I just want you to spend a moment of quietness before God, before I ask you to stand and give the altar call. In this moment of quietness before God, you decide That whatever I have shared from the Word of God applies to you in your situation. I don't know what it is that you have promised God in the past. I don't know what it is in your life that you know that you need to grapple with so that the core essentials become core essentials and not crowded out by peripherals and thorns that snuff out the spirit in your life you know that so I want to give you a moment of quietness no one looking around 
you decide. There are those of you who have yet to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Then I ask you to stand. You can come forward to my left. And there will be people here who will help you. You decide. And for the rest, if God has spoken to you, you come forward. By coming forward, you say, Pastor, yes, I'm the one. It's time to say yes. I will say yes. Whatever it is the Lord wants me to do, I don't want to waste my time away. Squander it. The kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy. In the Holy Ghost. Just spend a moment of quietness where you do that. Wherever you're sitting, on the floor, on the balcony, God is speaking to you. Remember the picture? God speak to me. I believe God has spoken. You respond. You don't need to know what lies ahead. All that you need to know is who holds the future in His hand. And you will never be shortchanged with Him. Believe me, you will never, never be shortchanged. Father, I thank you, Father, for your presence this morning. I thank you for the word of God that has gone forth. I pray, God, that you will minister to every one of us in love, in love, that we will respond also in love. We respond in love, not out of compulsion, but because we love you, Lord. We really love you. We owe to you a debt we can never repay. And yet, you're such a good God. Because your love is unconditional, is pure, it is unconditional. You love us just as we are. You and I, we don't have to prove a point. God loves us. So Father, I would pray that even as we respond to you in love, as we take one step to you, you will take ten steps towards us. Oh, hallelujah, Father, we bless your name. We bless you, Father. We really want to bless your name. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me? We sing this song. The altar call is open. Those of you who accept Jesus, turn to my left. And the others, you want to respond to God your way. I've chosen this closing song, I Love You, Lord. Because the stanza is composed by my son, Christopher. In this song, there's no stanza, but it's all Watan S.I.B. And I, I love it because it encapsulates everything that I share with you. You honour the Lord. I love you, Lord. Should we do that? And then if you sing, you respond to, to his call. I don't know what it is, but you respond to him in your way. You respond to him. Do you do that? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Someone has said this. He says, yesterday was a cashed out check. Tomorrow is a post-dated check. There may even be no money in the bank. But today is cash in hand. Yesterday was a cashed out check. Tomorrow is a post dated check. You hope there is money in the bank. But today, cash is king. Use it wisely. Use it wisely.
spend your life loving God. Honor Him. Just spend a moment of quietness. I'm going to close in a short while. Will you do that? The presence of God is here. This is the house of God. Wherever you're standing, take stock of your life. Live for Him. There must be something that you can do to advance the kingdom of God. There must be something. God will give you a higher purpose in your life, a higher cause. You will live your life differently. Believe me. You still feel that God wants you to come forward, you do that as I close and read to you Isaiah 43. God says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing in your life. Will you allow Him? Now, it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert. Streams in the wasteland. Do you not perceive it? Now, I want to do a new thing in your life. Wow. Away in the desert, streams in the wasteland. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. As I give benediction. You feel God is speaking to you. Sleep from your seat. If you're not yet a Christian, now is the time. Now is the time to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for the word that has gone forth. I know, Lord, that it has gone forth to encourage us, to provoke us to good deeds, to good deeds, so that we live our lives to honour you, to love you. So, Father, I speak blessing to every family here. I speak life to every heart here. I speak blessing to their children. I speak blessing to their grandchildren. I speak blessing to their family members. Some of them are not here with us, but wherever they are, Father, I know that God, you are there touching them right now. And even those who have not yet known you, Father, even our children, our loved ones who are far away from you, Right even now, even as I begin to pray, Father, I know you will send good men and salvation will come to our household. So, Father, I want to bless every family here today. Bless the work of their hands. Bless the fruit of their labors. And everything that we do, bring you glory. Bring you honor. Oh, Father, we bless your name. So, Father, separate us now with your blessing. Make us safely home. Go back and bless your families. And so, may the Lord bless you and keep you this day. May the Lord always make His face to shine upon you and always be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face to you and always grant you Shalom.